right. So yeah, hi everyone. Thank you for joining my talk and welcome. Uh, my name is Elena and I work at Aurelie International, which is an automotive engineering services provider, and I'm a Neo4j Ninja. So if you've read my abstract, then you've seen a lot of things about magic and knights. And actually, that's going to be the theme that I want to stick with today as well. So what we're going to talk about is the adventure of a knight trying to rescue the princess from the castle tower by fighting the dragon. And now imagine you're the knight. Then you might want to plan your adventure. So you might think, well, what kind of actions do I need to take and how long is it going to take me? So let's just look at very short um, adventure that it could be. So let's say it's really short. So you just need to ride to the dragon cave. You need to fight the dragon and then free the princess. Really good. Um, let's assume this takes like four hours. Then you need to fight the dragon takes one hour and freeing the princess also takes one hour. Then of course, the duration of your complete adventure is going to be six hours. But let's assume you're not alone. Let's assume you have another companion with you. So maybe you can split tasks. So maybe you both need to still ride to the dragon cave. So still going to take you four hours, but then your companion can fight the dragon. That's nice because you're at risk getting harmed. And in the meantime, you can free the princess. Great, and this adventure already is shorter, so it's four and then a parallel one hour, so it's five hours. Okay, cool. But what if you're not the only ones? What if you're one of the knights of the round table? And what if there's way more to do? And even before a being able to go to the dragon cave, you need to find Excalibur and need to have the Holy Grail ready. And maybe you can split these tasks between your other knights and um, some of which can go to the Excalibur, some of which can go on the quest for the Holy Grail. And maybe even before that, you need to go to the Enchanted Forest and find that witch and get the magic potion of strength and so on and so on. So what if there's a lot more to do and you can split things uh, between the knights? Well, I didn't want to sit here and just write a lot of cipher create notes uh, to come up with some big scheme, but I wanted to show you. And um, that's one of the first things that I want to say here. In a lot of projects that I face, actually the scheme schema of the graph is quite ready or we kind of know what we want to do and we want to do some algorithms on it, but uh, we don't have the real data yet. Especially if you want to build up knowledge graphs with the knowledge of your employees, for example, that's a process where you need to grow the graph and you don't have that in the beginning. So what can you do? Well, for example, you could start using the mock data generator that has been introduced by Neo4j at the beginning of the year. If you have not seen it yet, there's also going to be a talk by Jason Koo actually in around 14 hours in the America's time zone. So you can check that out. But in that, um, you can't do some things that I want to show here. So for example, you can give a schema saying, okay, well, I have some actions and I have other actions that precede these actions. Um, but in our case, we need a graph that is circle free, right? So you can't have something that precedes another action and then goes back again. So the complete graph needs to be circle free. And hence, you need some your own logic that does that for you. And actually, I'm going to quickly clear the database that's known so that nothing's in there anymore. And I'm going to um, show you a user defined procedure that I wrote. So this is actually a user defined procedure. Um, which generates a graph for me. And in this case, um, so I'm just giving it some config that I configured before the talk. And um, actually, I'm giving it a seed. So what, it, what it's doing is that it's not all creating all the time the same graph, but there's some randomness inside. And I can provide a seed and then get different graphs. So in this case, for example, I said I want between 19, 90 and 110 nodes. And giving different seats will get me different amounts of nodes in this interval. So let's quickly run that and see what it gives us. So in this case, we generated 94 nodes, 249 procedure edges, and actually four nodes are at the beginning. And let's quickly have a look at that graph. So here it is. And I'm going to make that a bit bigger and zoom in a bit. And what you see is a lot of actions in there. And you see also some blue nodes. Well, these are just some auxiliary nodes here, marking the start and the end to be able to draw it a bit apart. So let's zoom in a bit more to the beginning. And as the summary already said, there's like four nodes that directly are connected to the action zero, so that don't have a predecessor. And actually, if I want to ask now, so for these 94 actions, what's the duration of my uh, adventure going to be, then I need a graph traversal. 
right? I need to go from the very start to the very end and then calculate the earliest start times of the actions and the finish times, right? Okay, that's quite easy for the first four. Well, they can start at hour zero, nothing is preceding them, and they have a specific duration, like in this case, uh, this has a duration of 18, and so it means it needs 18 hours to complete, and then after that, other activities can start. So, but we have to be cautious because, for example, this activity cannot start directly after these 18 hours because there's another predecessor, right? And so that's very convoluted here. But there are other nodes, like I think, for example, this one here, that can actually start after action 13 is finished because it doesn't have another predecessor. Okay, so that means we need to iterate through the whole graph. So how would we do that? How would we write this um, algorithm? Maybe your first thought could be, well, I'm just going to write a Python script that sends transactions to this graph and just traverses it using Cypher. Great, and that's exactly what I did. So let's quickly have a look at some code. So I wrote a Python uh, script that um, is quite short, so it's 68 lines, and um, it doesn't do much. Well, there's some uh, initialization going on here at the beginning for the starting nodes. We shouldn't worry about that right now, but basically there's this loop that just processes the nodes over and over again from the start to the finish uh, until there's nothing left anymore. And let's quickly look at that. So basically this function is really easy. Um, it just calls a transaction uh, with this cipher query over and over again, which matches the actions where all the predecessors have already been finished and then takes the maximum of the finish times of the predecessors and puts that as the earliest start of the successor node and also calculates the earliest finish of it by just adding the duration. And like that, we can proceed from, from the beginning to the end. And at some point we're done and we have the duration of our complete adventure. Let's quickly run that. So um, it's now executing. And normally in my test, it took around like three seconds and we see that here, great, it took three seconds. And now look again um, at the graph. And if we now return the earliest start and the earliest finish times, uh, we see that they have been filled now. And uh, we actually see what we saw in the beginning. There are four nodes that can start at the beginning. So they start at hour zero. And here we have the node that we saw earlier that has a duration of 18, which finishes at 18. And down here, we have the action 34 that we saw earlier here, um, which starts after action 13 is finished at hour 15. And then just goes on until 23. So now we can see how long this is all going to take, and it's going to take us 444 hours. OK, but what if that's even bigger? What if we don't have like just 100, but maybe 1,000 actions? So there's a lot of to do. Um, again, I'm using my user-defined procedure to generate the graph. And this is already taking a bit longer to generate the graph than just in a second. Um, and then we'll see that there's going to be a lot more nodes being created. Some seconds more, and then we'll have that. And I'm not going to go into the details of this graph because it's just going to be the same graph, uh, just a bit bigger. OK, here we go. Uh, we have 994 nodes and a lot more relationships. And now if we want to run our Python script again to see what the adventure is going to be like, let's quickly do that. We'll see that it's already going to take a bit longer than before. And of course, sending these transactions all the time to the database takes time. So in this case, it took 6.74 6 seconds. And the bigger your graph is going to get, the longer this is going to take because you need all these transactions because the Python code is outside of the database and it's sending the transactions inside the database and always fetching data, sending, sending, fetching, fetching. OK, how could this be done better? So I'm quickly going to reset the database here. So um, I'm going to delete the earliest start and earliest finish times. So let's check that this has already has really happened. So on the notes, there's no earliest start and earliest finish anymore. But I still kept the notes. And actually, what you can do is you can write a user-defined procedure again. So the user-defined procedure lives inside of your database. It's not doing transactions from the outside. And hence, it's much qu quicker. So let's also quickly have a look uh, at the code 
of that. So uh, I also implemented that in a user-defined procedure. And it might look a bit bigger and a bit more scary here um, because it's a bit more code. It takes like 188 lines. But I wanted to be very specific with the comments. So like most of that stuff here is comments. So I think at the end, it's also like just 80 lines of code or so. And if you see that as well, we switched the language. So we went from Python to Java because the user-defined procedures are written in Java. So let's quickly have a look as well. So we have a procedure here, uh, which takes the start node as the beginning, does as well some initialization. And basically there's a while loop here as well, where we loop through the nodes and do stuff on the nodes. So we set the earliest start and the earliest finish of the successor nodes that can already be processed. And the nice thing here as well is you can use whatever you want in Java, right? You can use, for example, queues where you store the nodes. So you don't need to fetch them over and over again after a Cypher query is finished, but you can actually store the node objects of the database and then execute stuff on them. So uh, what you need to do with a um, user-defined procedure is deploy it into the database. So I already did that here. And uh, you can then call it just like you saw with the call for the um, graph generation. So I'm just going to call this forward path um, method on the action zero. And we'll see, okay, instantly after 0.1 seconds, it's done its job. And let's look again at the earliest start and earliest finish times. And we'll see it calculated. All right. And let's go back to the slides again, um, because I want to show that in a table. So uh, I did already one more test. So I tested it with 10,000 nodes. And you see that the Python uh, takes already way longer. So it's already at 80 seconds, whereas the UDP still performs in, wonder, in under a second. And this is because in, in Python or using the Neo4j driver in any language basically uses all these transactions that you need to do against the database, whereas the UDP lives inside the database. And actually, um, in a project that I implemented at at the company that I work for right now, we had the case that in the beginning, we were also writing our algorithms in Cypher just to test them out, just to see how it's going to work. And uh, a whole graph uh, traversal took us about five minutes. And then we transformed everything into UDPs. And now it takes three seconds. So that's a factor of 100. And actually, you see that in this table as well. So uh, let us look at the benefits of that we get when we use UDPs. So uh, first of all, you have a high efficiency and a high speed. You see that here. Um, the UDP is much quicker because it doesn't have to do all these transactions against the database, and it just lives within the database. Secondly, it's really nice that when you uh, traverse the graph, you can just stop at any node and do whatever you want and do as many complex calculations as you want on this node um, and then proceed without losing track. So of course, you could do that in Cypher as well when you have a lot of complex statements one after the other. Um, but then you, yeah, it's quite, quite difficult to keep track of where you are. And the third and for me, a very important point, uh, you have the full power and luxury of a high level programming language, right? You can use uh, whatever data structures you like. So you can put your notes into hash sets or into queues or lists or whatever you use in your daily life of coding. And you can use seats, uh, which is really nice for us as well, because if you implement your algorithms, you maybe want to um, run the algorithms on a million different configurations of your graph to see whether you've uh, not uh, implemented any bugs in there. So you can run a billion tests um, just by using different seeds and then also um, realizing which seed's going to cause you a problem and then debug on that seed. So and actually, what I didn't really talk about today um, is the refactoring safety and type safety. But actually, uh, I was invited with a colleague um, to Neo4j Live. That's going to that's gonna be a session on November 23rd where we're going to talk about how to make your code type safe in, in the UDP context. So um, yeah, you saw that here. So my code is also available on GitHub. So everything that I showed today, you can just have a look into that and uh, um, see whether you like it. Um, and if you want to know more, please get in touch. Uh, don't hesitate. I like talking about UDPs. And yeah, with that, uh, I hope you enjoyed my talk. And uh, I wish you a great time at all the other nice talks at Notes. And I'm quickly going to look at maybe some questions. but. I don't see any others, maybe in the question.
Did your cipher solution take five minutes? Use the new quantified path um, patterns. No, so the cipher solution um, that uh, lived four years ago. So that's already quite a long time ago. Um, so no. <laughs> Um, so there's another question that I'm quickly going to answer. So if you don't mind, uh, once created all the nodes and their relationships, so then if we want to display the graphs for the particular required node of all the relationships, so how can we do it as per required separately? Um, so I don't get the question. Sorry. If you, if you could just message me in the chat, um, I will just answer the question as well later. All right. Uh, can you show how UDPs look like? That's another question. So I showed the code quickly, so maybe I can uh, just show that again and you can have a look at the GitHub. Um, so this is a UDP, right? This is a procedure that is written in Java that has this procedure annotation. And then it's just plain Java code, basically. And uh, there's maybe a last question. Uh, I didn't try UDP yet. How did you put it into the database? So what you need to do uh, with the Java code, you need to compile it. So um, in VS Code, there's um, you can just type Maven clean install. So it's a Maven project. Um, or like in NetBeans, it's clean and build. Um, and then you have a jar file. And you need to put the jar file into the plugin folder of your Neo4j database. So if you go to the Neo4j database, there you have the three dots. You can just uh, click on that and go to the folder that contains the database. You've probably seen that from the import folder. Um, and there's another folder next to it, which is called plugins. You just Put it in there, the jar file that you generated, restart your database, and your procedures are available. Okay, and with that, I'm going to say thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'm going to go offline. Thanks.